Um, hi, my name is Caris Medina. Uh, I'm the associate curator at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. Um, thank you for joining me today in my home studio. Uh, I hope that my neighbors are gonna have a nice quiet afternoon. Um, so first of all, I just want to uh, thank Regna and everyone at the New York Textile Month for inviting me to participate in this really wonderful celebration of textiles. We are in a very strange world, but they've done a really amazing job of organizing so many fantastic uh, virtual events. And so thank you for joining me today. Uh, I come into the world of weaving through Annie Albers. I had a long interest in textiles, but it wasn't until I started really, really looking at Annie's weavings uh, that I first thought about sitting at a loom myself. I needed to know more about Annie's weavings, about how they were constructed. And, and the more I learned about them, the more I realized really how brilliant Annie Albers was. Before I continue here, I also want to um, just say I will be forever indebted to my friend, uh, an incredible weaver, Ismini Simonadu, for initially starting me down this uh, path of exploration. In the summer of 2014, Ismini and I, along with Francesca Capone and a few others at the Albers Foundation, closely examined two of Annie's weavings from 1954. That encounter, with their encouragement, set in motion my research, which is really an experiment in looking. Uh, I'm sharing with you today what I have, which is still very much in progress uh, and ongoing. So for the sake of this talk and for time, uh, I'm gonna skip what is possibly a very familiar background um, of Annie Albers' biography. Um, but if anyone wants to know more, I'm happy to share resources or answer any questions at the end of this talk. Um, so let's hop in. Annie Albers wrote often and she wrote eloquently. She wrote about the ideological stance of the Bauhaus weaving workshop and of the problems of the modern industrial production. She wrote about the history and genesis of weaving through the ancient world, about the evolution of the loom, about weaving's relationship to architecture, and she even wrote about jewelry. Now, although she wrote so much uh, and about so many different aspects of weaving, the fact remains that she wrote very little about her pictorial weavings, and she wrote even less about the process of making them. The pictorial weavings, which is a term that she coined for her weavings that were a particular body of work made from 1933 to 68, which she said were headed towards art. This group, depending on how you choose to define them, range from either 30 works to up to 60. One of the only texts that she wrote, which directly addresses her pictorial weavings, was published in the catalog for the 1959 exhibition, Annie Albers Pictorial Weavings at MIT. It's short and poetic, but I think it can provide a rubric for how she might have wanted us to approach her work. She writes, though some of the earliest weavings, unearthed after thousands of years, have the magic of things not yet found useful, and later periods have shown us weaving as art, thousands of years of establishing and expanding the usefulness of woven materials have made us see in them first something to be worn, to be walked on, sat on, to be cut up, even sewn together again, largely something no longer itself useful, to let threads be articulate again and find a form for themselves to no other end than their own orchestration, not to be sat on, walked on, only to be looked at. That is the raison d'etre of my pictorial weavings. While she often spoke about her weavings theoretically and even pragmatically in her book on weaving, first published in 1965, Albers was not particularly interested in laying bare the specifics of her own technique or processes. If we begin looking at Albers's work from the Bauhaus, there are often 
diagrammatic sketches or weaving plans for her early wall hangings and utilitarian fabrics. A few of them show multiple variations of a similar composition, each an iteration or permutation of another possibility of composition. But somewhere along the way, those drawings disappear from her practice. Whether or not Albers continued to create these diagrams, weaving plans, or drawings for her pictorial weavings beyond the Bauhaus is unknown to us, as there are no traces of any such drawings in Albers' archive. From various archival materials and from some of the textiles themselves, we know that the practice of warp sharing was quite common in the Bauhaus weaving workshop. A few weavers might develop a warp and then take turns making weaving experiments. This is how so many of the textiles, especially samples from the Bauhaus, can seem so related, even though they're made by different weavers. This practice of fitting a loom with a long warp is something must, that must have stuck with Albers because she is, it is quite apparent in her weavings. So quick technical primer, although very unlikely necessary for a lot of the people joining us today, but uh, dressing a loom is a pretty time consuming process with very few possibilities for shortcuts. Uh, on a very basic level, a weaving is made by overlapping and intertwining two sets of threads. One set of threads, the warp, is held under tension and the other set of threads, the weft, is manipulated by the weaver and is intersected and woven into the warp. These warp threads must be measured to equal length and then individually threaded into the loom. Depending on the scale, this process could take hours, even days, or for me, could be weeks. This is all before one sits down to place the first intersecting weft thread. Because of this, weavers are often economical about their loom, their warps. To use time and material efficiently, a weaver may measure out a very long warp, long enough for more than one weaving. But without diagrams or weaving plans, sketches or notes, we're left to look at Annie Albers' weavings much in the same way she looked at the great Andean or pre-Hispanic weavings she so admired in her youth and eventually collected. Enthralled by these weavings, we can imagine Albers at her studio table with an Andean textile in front of her, perhaps this very one. One hand on a needle or a tweezer, she gently lifts warp away from weft, slowly loosening the fibers, gently breaking the weft threads to begin the nearly impossible task of unweaving this incredibly masterful textile until she can start to understand the intricacies of its structure, its double weave, its warp face pattern, otherwise obscuring structures to its uh, secrets to its construction. It is this vision of Annie Albers that I hold close in mind when I'm studying her weavings, looking closer and closer still, even sometimes with a tweezer in hand. Although I am not in the business of unpicking Annie Albers' threads, at least not in a literal sense. It is in this spirit though that we begin by looking closely at her primary material, the threads, the very warp. So for this, talk, I'll stick primarily to those weavings between 1948 and 1965, a period of some of Albers's most staggering productivity. In 1948 and 49, Albers is in transition. She and her husband, Joseph, are in the process of leaving Black Mountain College in Asheville, North Carolina, the place where they had lived and taught for 15 years. Albers is also preparing for her first major solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, an exhibition which mostly includes utilitarian fabrics, room dividers, typewriter experiments, and pre-textile studies. It is also the, the earliest documented instance of Albers presenting framed textiles. And in the top in that image there, we can see a small square framed textile, which is this work here, Untitled, from 1948. This is one of the, the earliest framed works, an abstract textile woven in a tapestry style in blacks and blues, browns and creams. 
I always kind of regarded these textiles as transitional works, a middle ground between early Bauhaus weavings and a few of the ta tapestries which Albers had produced while at Black Mountain College in 1941 and in 1947. But in these two, we see something a little bit different going on. Something starting with the fact that they have the same warp. When turned and aligned, in this case, the untitled weaving on the left is turned 90 degrees clockwise and city on the right is turned 90 degrees counterclockwise. We see the warp stripes of these weavings align. Now, please bear with me that for the sake of a wider screen format, I've laid the weavings out horizontally so you can see the continuous warp moving from left to right. We can imagine ourselves as if we were standing beside Annie's loom as she unwinds and stretches out the woven textile. So we have them kind of going this way. Once we begin to really notice this alternating black and white warp stripe as an essential but independent part of the weaving, it begins to reveal itself in unsuspected places. For instance, we can see the same alternating black and, warp and white warp stripe in this fabric sample that Albers called a display fabric in 1949. Interestingly, we see Albers working in both pictorial weaving or art and designing of a utilitarian fabric, so design, in the same breath, right, so to speak, breaking this division between what is art and what is design understanding that she's working with the same concepts to think about how different permutations can come out of the same, out of a specific grid or a specific warp. For Albers, the act of designing a utilitarian fabric comes from the same place as creating a pictorial weaving. It comes from, as she would often say, listening to the material or allowing the threads to speak for themselves. In black, white, gold one and two from 1950, we begin to see Albers establish a specific form in the pictorial weaving. A pictorial weaving tends to be a small frameable picture with a small AA stitched at the bottom. In these, we see the warp stripe, but really it's the supplemental weft that begins to dominate the composition. This calligraphic line, the interrupting knots, the intermixed lurex threads, these elements of black, white, gold really become in some ways some of the hallmarks uh, of Annie's pictorial weavings. The two weavings, as with the previous two, also follow the same rotational pattern in the, as in the earlier two works. Rather than woven in the same orientation, one is rotated 90 degrees clockwise and the other counterclockwise. So that rather than top to bottom, I've joined them bottom to bottom here. With their titles and forms, Albers blatantly tells us that these weavings are related, but it wasn't until identifying the display fabric from 1949 that the full connection or family of warps became clear, connecting what are fairly disparate works. Put all together, we can see that the black and white warp stripe, we can see the black and white warp stripe making its way through all of these works. In a way, we were rebuilding Annie's warp 70 years after the fact in, a, in an order to get a better idea of what may have happened in her studio. After moving to Connecticut in 1950, Albers had to reestablish her studio. For the first time since the Bauhaus, she didn't have any official teaching duties and was able to devote her time to weaving. Around this time, in 1952, she purchased two eight harness Structo Arcraft 750 looms. These two looms are nearly identical. And after 1965, they were the only looms Albers had in her studio. And here she is sitting at the Structo Arcraft. Based on the 26 inch weaving width allowance on these looms, it's likely that the majority of her pictorial weavings and possibly quite a lot of industrial weave, uh, textiles as well um, were made on these looms. Although the loom is quite small, 
basically a table leg on or a table loom on legs and its mechanism has its mechanism has a, a harness locking capability which would have allowed her more flexibility and freedom to do that time consuming manual manipulation such as lino or gauze weave or introducing um, supplemental wefts with more ease recently the Albers Foundation has lent two of these looms out for exhibition. Uh, both of these exhibitions have been featured during Textile Month. One of them was in the now closed In Thread and on Paper at the New Britain Museum of American Art. It's the image on the left. And the other loom is currently installed at MoMA as a part of the exhibition, Taking a Thread for a Walk in Architecture and Design. So back to the textiles. As in black, white, gold, the relationship of these two textiles, development in rows one and two, uh, is explicitly denoted in the titles. Still, they required a little bit of imagination to determine that they are in fact made together, made of the same stuff. Development in rows one is a subtle, creamy weaving had long been in a private collection for many years in a sun-drenched room, whereas development in rows two uh, very quickly entered a museum collection where its exposure to light has been limited. However, if we look at the verso of development in rows one, the relationship becomes a little bit more apparent. These, are, these photos uh, were taken during conservation about 20 years ago, and they show the preserved color on the back of the weaving. There were clearly, uh, we see the warp stripes in pink, coral, orange, and natural linen. The subtlety of color in development in rows one is not a fact of the weaving structure or its materials, but a result of years of sun exposure, causing the pigmented linen fibers to lose their hue. When we put the two weave, these two weavings together, again, using the verso of the faded weaving here, we see the warp stripes align perfectly in both weavings. The orientation of these compositions again is rotated. Perhaps these decisions were not finalized until they actually came off the loom. There, now relaxed, uh, taking in the entire composition, Albers collaborates with this finished work, rotating it, stitching her monograph to set the orientation that pleased her Perhaps Albers intentionally rotated her composition to orchestrate the wefts under inverse rules. By flipping the weave, one of the weavings, she has, in a sense, already created a totally different composition, even down to the layout of the warp stripe. She's still saving time, and she's afforded herself more variation. Much in the same way that, that much later, <laughs> she'd turn the silk screens while printing her meander screen prints, overlapping register in order to create an even more complex composition uh, with economic means. These next two weavings are fairly e easily matched with one another in part because unlike all the rest of the pictorial weavings, once woven, these two weavings were rotated 90 degrees from the loom orientation. And so when, we, when they're displayed, the warps are running horizontally. There are no other works that Annie has made that, that she is oriented in this way. They're made with, a cotton, with cotton and linen warps, and they both are made of this underlying 15 unit checkerboard grid, partly created by end-to-end -end pattern warp alternating one thick fiber, one thin fiber for approximately 1.5 inches, and then switching the pattern. On this support, brown and dark beige brocaded threads and supplemental wefts create meandering st structural maze-like compositions. Here's a close up where you might be able to spot that switch of the end to end. In the center section, we see the pattern go from thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, for about an inch and a half, and then from thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, to thin, thick. Uh, so there's this moment where there are two of the same 
sized warps right next to each other, which this then creates this subtle syncopated background. In 1954, Alvarez does another switch. She starts changing again and begins to surprise us even more. It's here that Albers really starts to use the full structure of the warp for the purposes of improvisation and begins to challenge it beyond what she's done before. These two weavings share a warp of an alternating orange, white, and brown uh, cotton warp fibers organized in 28 equally sized vertical columns. She creates these two wildly different weavings by using the same prescribed grid. One red meander is a dense maze in red or orange and white double cloth. And the other weaving, red and blue layers, is this colorful exploration of gauze weave, which take full advantage of the double cloth and constantly alter the plane, making fibers appear and disappear again beneath another layer. It was really this pair that ignited my research. If these two pretty disparate works could be made on the same warp of the same structural orchestration, in if we will, there must be other families. That's what really set me off looking at it. Four years later, we find ourselves with another set of weavings that also share a warp consistent, con consisting of 28 equally sized vertical warp stripes. Again, orange and white, but this time with a slightly different dark fiber. Both of these pictorial weavings, Pasture and South of the Border, whose titles reference landscape, seem initially to share a total disregard for the grid, particularly south of the border, where the colors seem to rise and fall organically, paying no mind to the linear structure of weaving. When we look closely at the warps, we see this, the detail of that warp family. Orange, white, and this gray, black fiber. These two pretty easily go hand in hand with one another. But with a little bit closer study, we can see that although the warp, the black fiber in the warp is not exactly the same, it seems quite related. Perhaps she ran out of a fiber or had a bit left of something else. In either case, we can imagine that these two weavings and the previous two, red meander and the red and blue layers, could be something like cousins in the same brilliantly colored family. Now, a note here about the break in time, the first two weavings made in 1954 and the second in 1958. Uh, many weavers can tell you that while it may not be ideal or planned, there can in fact be years between completing weavings. With the case of this particular time period, in addition to creating pictorial weavings, Albers was also designing textiles for industrial production, as well as other commissions. Around 1956 and 57, Albers designed these arc panels for Temple Emmanuel in Dallas, Texas. The panels, which were industrially produced, were designed by Albers. The panels are on the right, and the maquette here is um, on the left. We can see in the maquette a small sample of the material, which would then be used for the panels, is woven in alternating bands of shiny lurex or metallic fibers. In 1957, we start with another set of weavings that follow a sort of similar path to the last set. Northwesterly from 1957, is also a double cloth made of a complementary warp of blue, yellow, white, and brown, although here it looks a bit black, um, threads. Again, we have another 15 unit vertical grid here. And again, with a lot of supplemental lifts. 
there's this double weave uh, structure in orbit from 1957. And this uh, sheep may safely graze from 1958, which is very related to um, Northwesterly, but the weft fibers here, in fact, are lorex threads. Perhaps the same lorex threads Albers used in designing the arc panels for Dallas, the year which was completed in 1957, the year before this work was completed. So again, we see materials being shared from projects to projects within the pictorial weavings, but then in fact, even to an architectural commission. And finally, in this family, Tikal, a weaving made up almost entirely of warp, seemingly barely held together by small areas of discontinued swefts on a ground of sparse gauze. Here's the whole family. And there we see the 15 uh, warp units aligned across all of the textiles. So once I started seeing these families, it was really impossible not to see them everywhere. Expanding where we are from here, we can find another family uh, with, starting with Memo from 1958. These weavings are made on a four fiber warp, alternating again, uh, one black linen fiber, one black cotton fiber one white wool boucle and one white cotton fiber. You can see in that detail, perhaps a bit of the detail of the warp in the fringe. But similarly, in the case of, uh, as in the case of development in rows, one of these textiles doesn't really fit in to the warp color. Uh, by all accounts, variations on a theme is brown and beige. But upon closer inspection, tweezers here, we see below the first layer of warps and discover that the second layer has not faded and retains its black and white uh, pigment as in its companions. And so for the sake of visualizing, we experiment by restoring digitally the original color of this weaving. And then finally, jotting is another dense exploration of weaving, or of lino, sorry. Unfortunately, this work has been lost, so we can't fully uh, analyze it, but it does fit quite well. And the measurements we have in the archives seem to, to agree with this. Like in the earlier families, it's also quite interesting to note that these weavings whose structure and warp materials are shared amongst themselves also share another commonality, that their titles are also evocative of written communication. Here, memo, open letter, jotting, and perhaps then variations on a theme create a sort of narrative of writing or the physicality of it. The twists and knots in the lino in a way almost relate to kipus and the history of textiles used in storytelling or record keeping. Here in Scroll from 1962, Albers returns to an aesthetic and motif of her weavings from 1950, the very first ones. The subtle brown, cream, and black warp stripe in this is then woven with bits of golden lurex and two meandering supplemental wefts of black and white chenille. This work is on a very different scale than the majority of the pictorial weavings, but begins a new warp. One which seems to be a prototype or a study for her next large scale commission. These are the arc panels and curtains designed and woven for the Temple B'nai Israel in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. These six panels, completed in 1962, are each unique weavings made on the same warp. 
Here, the orientation of the warp remains the same, but the quantity and composition of the lorax and supplemental chenille create the difference in the composition. When placed end to end, we see that scroll is made of the very same warp material as the wound socket panels. Just a note here, the wound socket panels um, are currently undergoing conservation um, overseen by the Albers Foundation. So the, the image of the wound socket panel is a bit distorted in part because of 50 years of use, um, but also because in the process of uh, restoring these works, they've come off of their support. So, so they're actually pinned down uh, for these photographs, uh, but they will be restored to individual panels soon. So the last group of weavings from the early 1960s is a again a return to the warp stripe. Here, alternating orange, black, orange, white warp sections create this very graphic element within which undulating and calligraphic supplemental wefts weave their way through bands of contrasting color. or even seem to quietly slink their way up and around thick golden lurex. As with the case of the very first family of pictorial weavings, we find a textile sample in twill in this last family. We don't know exactly what this uh, was intended for. Could have been upholstery, drapery, a rug, or simply an experiment uh, in structure. But one last transformation to the warp takes place before this family is complete. Now, the black and white warp stripes are completely removed, leaving only the orange warps. So you'll see in a detail, there's only the orange warps remaining, there's gaps in between. So there are now 16 evenly spaced gaps between each of these orange bands, stripes, which in the case of underway, gives a lot of space for vibrant red and white supplemental wefts to travel through the surface and seem with seemingly no beginning or end. Sunny follows suit. Uh, also, again, with only the orange warps left. This time, rather than using voluminous wefts, here Albers opts for short lengths of supplemental wefts and even knots in embroidery floss and linen. Blue and green, pale yellow against these golden wefts. And here's the whole family. With the entire family, we see this warp start with those orange, black, orange, white sections until all we're left with is the orange warp in the final two weavings. This warp family going from sort of a densely woven textile to an open weave held by those vertical ribs, slowly taking the textile down to its most basic parts, a few warps and a few wefts. Albers knows just how much is needed in order to maintain her structure, in order to keep the textile together. So I suppose you can ask, and many likely do, why should we look at Albers' weavings in this way? There is certainly a sense in which this particular method of looking uh, can become analytical, detached, or technical with the risk of stripping away the aesthetic from the structural. But in fact, I would like to believe that Annie Albers would have appreciated this way of looking. Looking closer and closer still at the object, knowing not only its appearance, but knowing its whole form. Her weavings call out to us to be examined. We want to look at their backs, at, their under, at the underneath, at the inside, we desire to see them laid out in front of us, as if on a loop. 
we fight the urge to pick apart the stitches and imagine them back on the loom in the very beginning of their process. Annie Albers understood their structure and appearance because in weaving, there is no difference. A, a weaving is the sum of the orchestration or construction of its individual threads, or maybe, as she would say, the event of a thread. This is the way Annie Albers looked at textiles. In a way, it is an exercise in seeing. So perhaps she asks us to look with her, to let threads be articulate again, to find a form for themselves, to no other end than their own orchestration. Thank you. So, you see there's some questions. I think I can navigate this. So the first question is about um, the difference between a tapestry and a pictorial weaving for Annie Albers. I don't know that there is exactly, because she never told us exactly when or what was a pictorial weaving. We kind of have this vague time. There's a moment in which um, after arriving in the United States from, from Germany, from the Bauhaus, Annie Albers is still uh, making very large wall hangings. Um, they, those wall hangings were included in her 1959 exhibition, um, pictorial weavings, but later she refers to them as wall hangings. And that's kind of how we at the foundation still refer to them. Um, so we say really that the pictorial weavings are the smaller weavings that are framed that she considered artworks. I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question, but Um, so I'm going to take a really, there's a question about kipus. I'll take a really uh, quick stab at that. Um, from what I understand, kipus are, are not right, used in various um, parts of, of now Latin America. Uh, in ancient textiles, there would be uh, long fabrics or long threads uh, knotted in a particular types of knots or in particular patterns that were a way of uh, of record keeping, um, it, particularly in um, sort of pre-written culture. Please someone correct me if I have a better answer at that. Yes, I agree. Keeping a warp on uh, for a long time is not a bad idea. So uh, we have a question here about, have you examined any of the Bauhaus weavings both by other by Albers or by others, to see if there are any groupings or shared works. Uh, I have um, not examined very many of the Bauhaus weavings. Many of them are in Germany and have are very often not uh, lent out. Um, uh, the majority of of my work has been done during exhibitions. Uh, so when the Albers Foundation lends a lot of work to an exhibition, then there's a, there is an opportunity for me to see more of the weavings, which has been great. Um, I do know that the warp sharing does begin before this and have identified a couple earlier weavings, um, but for the sake of time, didn't want to cram everything in. Uh, the two weavings, uh, two of the weavings that Albers made in the United States, Ancient Writing and Monte Alban, which are the sort of the, the first two uh, weavings in the States, they're big um, uh, wall hanging size. Those are both made on the same warp. Um, and I do hope to, to continue examining. I still have a, a lot of work to look through. Um, a lot of these weavings that don't have fringe are in fact hemmed. Uh, sometimes rather crudely, but they are hemmed um, underneath and um, and then they're stitched onto a backing.
Daniela Pardo asks if there are similarities between Gunter Stotzels and Annie's compositions after the Bauhaus. Um, I have not really done a, a deep uh, examination of uh, Gunther's weavings, but I do, I can say of one area in which they, um, they in a way collaborated. Um, there were three weavings from the Bauhaus, um, I think three, uh, that were lost uh, during the war that Annie Albers still maintained um, designs for. And in about 1964, she and um, she got in touch with Gunther Stutzel. They had a, a, a correspondence um, about the possibility of recreating some of those weavings. And so, in fact, in 1964-65, Gunther Stutzel and her studio in Switzerland reproduced, uh, in addition series, um, a few of those Bauhaus weavings that were lost. Uh, one of them, there's one at the Met in New York, one in Chicago at the Art Institute, um, and through various other uh, institutions. Travis Hale asks about the length of her works. I have actually not uh, done the calculations. I have all the measurements and could pretty easily figure out, but I have not yet um, measured out the exact length to see if there's any um, consistency of the lengths of her warps, but I think that's a great idea. Um, so, um, as going back to um, the tapestries. So Annie Albers did, as far as we know, create most of her weavings on a floor loom. Um, although, in fact, at the Albers Foundation, we have an inkle loom and materials for card weaving. So it's quite hard to know exactly where and how every single um, uh, weaving was created, um, as well as some things that, that maybe walked away from her. So for just a little bit of a background, um, the Albers Foundation is the is the estate and foundation of the Alberses. So the majority of the works of Annie's um, that we have that were that are not the pictorial weavings, but sort of uh, archival material and um, and other materials like this were a part of her estate when she died. She had already given away her loom, so we actually reacquired those from a local school. Um, but there are definitely gaps in what we know in the in what she had equipment wise, material wise. Um, there's a couple of questions about my own weaving, uh, which is kind of on hold at the moment. Um, but I would say that I, as I looked at Annie's work, I've, anytime I have encountered a new weaving technique is something, this is, this is where then I try to experiment to understand it a little bit better on the loom. Um, definitely my studio time is much diminished compared to work time, uh, but it, I do find that they go hand in hand. I don't think I would have been able to do this research without sitting and trying to to play with uh, threads and get them in my hand. Um, but Annie Albers has been for sure my greatest teacher. Uh, and the more that I, the more that I sit at the loom with threads, the more um, I realize I know almost nothing of weaving <laughs> in comparison to, to working with Annie's textiles. Um, So there's this question of, uh, from Brian Fay about the importance of drawing in her practice, um, in her process. Uh, we do have a lot of drawings. Um, there are, there's a, a really fantastic notebook that was uh, re-editioned recently by um, David Zwerner uh, that are much later drawings. Um, so as I mentioned, the majority of of um, drawings relating to weavings um, that we know of um, 
emphasis there, uh, are related to the Bauhaus weavings. Um, we don't know how much preparatory drawing, if any, really, she did. I think there are certainly weavings that we, that I went through that are particularly the longer weavings or those with sort of very tight, specific compositions. Speculation is, it's, uh, you know, I have a hard time imagining that that is completely improvisation. But I do think a, a great majority of Annie's pictorial weavings were improvised on the loom, uh, designed on the loom. Perhaps she had an idea in mind, but I don't think there was a preparatory drawing for everything. I think in, in also in part the, that for her, what was more was important was the weaving, is this, this product in the end. And so if she had in fact created a drawing, that would be secondary. Uh, later, and maybe starting in the 40s, she does do drawings, but those are drawings. Um, the one moment of sort of overlap there is where some of those drawings, perhaps from the 40s, are then picked up in her prints um, that she produced um, starting in the 1960s, mid-60s, um, till really um, the end of her life. Um, so drawing was definitely always a part of it, but I'm not sure between the balance of tool or end product. Carl Seward uh, has a question about how she identified herself as a weaver, as an artist, as a designer. Um, I think this was a, a lifelong battle. Um, she was also an educator, which is something I really didn't talk about. Um, but she was teaching at Black Mountain College. Um, and she also did teach sort of on an independent individual level in uh, Connecticut. She had a few different students, including Sheila Hicks, um, who came to her house a number of times. Um, but she did often write about this question of designer and artist. Um, I'm not quite sure that she really uh, settled on that. Um, did Albers manipulate her work more freely for her pictorial weavings than her industrial fabrics? Yes and no. Uh, she experimented all of the time. Um, I think on a very surface level, the, with the supplemental weft, absolutely, we see that in the pictorial weavings because the structure, uh, although essential, um, you know, perhaps didn't have to be used. Um, but the ideas that she was playing with in, in the pictorial weavings with, again, sort of following the the, the yarn itself following these threads um, is something that we then do see, particularly I would say in like industrial textiles that she designed for casement cloths, um, for knoll, uh, which are these really intricate gauze and linos, really, really brilliant, um, beautiful weavings um, and fabrics and window coverings, I'm sure. Um, but experimentation was, I think, an essential part of her practice, no matter if she was making something useful or something to be art. Um, Amy asks about open letter and what is Oliver's telling us with the small red areas? Um, I don't know, um, but she is telling us something. Uh, in, in sort of the, the, the verbal history of the Albers Foundation, one of the things that we have heard as um, was Annie said that that weaving perhaps was her, uh, her communication to her husband, to Joseph. So I don't know that we're meant to know what those red areas are. Uh, Mia or Maya asks if I've published. I've not yet published this. Um, 
Um, I this is something that I'm still working on, but I'm very interested in publishing it. Um, but I'm happy to to um, get to answer questions you have. How are the textiles held between pieces of glass or fiberglass? Um, so now uh, these weavings that were sandwiched between these have been re remounted. So um, pretty much all of these weavings, this particular one in the last image here intersecting is um, I think at the Hirshhorn. Um, and at some point after this, uh, but before entering the museum, it was then stitched in, stitched down onto a, a linen fabric. Um, but in this case, I think that I'd have to refer to a, a frame maker. Uh, but I think that if you put two pieces of, of plexi together, um, there are sort of plexi pegs that can hold them together. It's a really, I think, a really beautiful way of looking at a textile. It's um, uh, perhaps not the best in terms of conservation, um, but it does allow you to see both sides. And I know it's something that, um, that Albers did do with a, a couple of the textiles. We have seen another weaving, I think, from 1959 that was also in the same type of thing. Um, Ruth Buchanan, your uh, question of, are the loom, is the setup on the loom a basic two block double weave? I believe so. Uh, but my um, uh, experience with double weave is still a bit, um, well, I've still, I have a lot of experience still needed. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I can answer that completely, but I, I do believe it's a pretty basic um, uh, double block, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Paulette asks uh, if Annie Albers raison d'etre immediate if she knew of her raison d'etre immediately or at the beginning of her career or if it unfolded as she completed her works. I think this is a really interesting question um, because uh, Annie Albers is is an artist who who um, in a lot of her writing you can see kind of battling with different things. Um, in fact, at the very beginning at the Bauhaus, she, in her own words, was not particularly interested in threads. Uh, she did not want to go into the weaving studio. Um, and she found threads to be, in her words, sissy. Uh, but she, she embraced it at some point, it seems. Um, I think that she always wanted to be seen as an artist. She wanted to be, to be able to do that. But that threads, uh, which I would say is probably still an incredibly relevant conversation now, um, that textiles or fiber art still have to battle uh, for their placement in and uh, recognition in the art world. Um, so I think that this is a, a, a search, uh, an ongoing um, process for Albers. Um, as for her, her uh, yarn suppliers, um, we have a list of suppliers. It seems that she was pretty, she was not very picky. Um, and she, although she had definitely had experience with dyeing um, fibers at the Bauhaus, was not something that she uh, seemed to be very interested in later on. Um, there are times in which in some of the weavings where she's using very basic materials, very everyday materials, even plastic tubing, I think she was very interested in using what was available to her um, and um, experimenting with sort of what is an art material and whatnot. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that she was particularly interested in using one supplier over another or um, you know, or one fiber over another. Yeah. 
how did Annie first come to weaving? So um, I would be, I would highly recommend um, that anyone who is interested in knowing more sort of about the history of Annie Albers, how she came to weaving, how um, she came to um, the Bauhaus and then eventually to the United States in 1933, um, check out the Albers Foundation website. We have some really, um, yeah, just really great resources. We've done a couple of videos. Um, a colleague and I participated or co collaborated on um, another video lecture, which is a little bit more, uh, goes a little bit further into her life um, and also into her writings. Um, we prepared that for the New Britain Museum of American Art, and that's called uh, Experiments. But the video for that, I think, is on our website. Um, and then there's also chronology and sort of a long history of um, both Annie and, and Joseph Albers. Um, ah, yes, the, the Black Mountain College exhibition at the Hammer a couple of years ago, in 2017, I think, um, did have a loom from Black Mountain College. Um, the Black Mountain College weaving studio was um, was established by and kind of organized by Annie Albers, um, but it um, she didn't take all of those things with her when they left. So she only held on to three three looms. I have just, um, but yes, but it's been great to be able to see. I think it's been really helpful in the last few years to have looms in the exhibition spaces. So with that show. Um, that traveled from the ICA in Boston to the Hammer, um, as well as the Annie Albers retrospective in Dusseldorf and Tate, and then these two shows I just mentioned. It's great to see the tool in, uh, in the space, because I think a lot of times people don't quite know how we're weaving, where it comes from. Uh, and so to see um, this very intimate tool um, in the space is really helpful. Um, I've just noticed the time, so um, I'm not sure, uh, Ragna, if we need to wrap up. There's still a couple questions, but... Um, yeah, you can finish. That's good. Okay. It's so interesting, yeah. Karis. So yeah, no... Take your time. We have nothing after, so... Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll keep going for a few more minutes then. Um, uh, okay. Sorry if I skipped a bit here. Let's see. Um, so yes, so there's a question here about framing. Uh, how did Annie Albers display her weaving framed, tacked to the wall, uh, so you could see the back? So there's a couple of different things. Uh, we've seen photos from Bauhaus and Black Mountain where um, wall hangings are just tacked up to the wall um, without any sort of structure or anything to them. Um, but then also these which we have at the Albers Foundation or in museum collections that are framed. Um, a lot of these framed, so as I sort of mentioned, the, the wall hangings tend to, to live either in very large frames, um, but the majority of them are, are not in frames. Uh, they would have been displayed straight on the wall um, and perhaps have only been framed for, you know, uh, the convenience of storage or for um, conservation. But these pictorial weavings are really pretty much always framed works. And that's one of the things, one of the tools that I've sort of used as distinguishing pictorial weaving from otherwise. Um, it's meant to be a picture. You know, it's meant to be on the wall and to be looked at. Um, so eventually the format was sort of right, uh, found its regular form with a, uh, the weaving then stitched to a uh, twill, linen, or sometimes even in some of these um, uh, very rough material. Um, and then that 
was then wrapped around a board and then framed. So in the majority of Annie's original framing, you do not see the back of the work. And in fact, the stitching that's holding it down to its support is pretty uh, subtle as well. Um, if Annie was a weaver today, how do you think she would source her materials? And do you think she would embrace new technologies in the field? Absolutely. I think that Annie Albers um, uh, at the Bauhaus and later in her work was super interested in new materials. She, it doesn't seem radical to us now, including plastics and cellophanes. But in fact, uh, at the Bauhaus, she was already combining things like linen or jute with a clear cellophane or plastic, which in the 1930s is a very new material. Um, so I think she would absolutely have uh, jumped right in to new materials and new fibers. Um, uh, not sure how she would have liked the internet, um, but I think that she probably would have been very open to finding materials anywhere. Um, and there is, there are a couple of, there are two weavings that were made in 1959 uh, that were, um, that are called the Vicara rugs. The, the Vicara was a fiber um, that was made of corn protein. And it was actually produced in uh, what is called the, the quiet corner, sort of the north, um, eastern corner of Connecticut. Uh, and this is, these two weavings are the only time that this material is used in Annie's work. Um, and it happened to be around the same time that the Vicara mill was shutting down. I'm not sure how she got her hands on that material, but it's possible that she was given something or she found something with a good deal. I think that she was, a, you know, um, always looking for a good deal as we all are. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, this sort of new experimental material was already quite interesting to her. Um, I also think that she would have been quite interested in computing uh, and having and, and sort of the hand in computers, but with a critical distance. Um, she talks a lot about how, and on weaving, she talks a lot about how she, um, how advancements in technology are important, but every advancement in technology in a way takes the hand away from the weaving. And so I think she would have been really fascinated uh, with the ideas of computers in, in weaving, um, but with a, with a skeptical lens. Um, it is uh, an incredible, there's a couple people asking about me having uh, sort of my, my hands on the weavings. It's a, an incredible honor, really, and privilege to be able to, to be with these works um, and, and in a way to have sort of stumbled into to this gem um, of research. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really such a privilege. Um, so it's, it's exciting, for sure. Um, As for, is she planned to railroad or turn her weavings ahead of time? Uh, impossible to know, unfortunately. Yeah, as I mentioned, she had, she didn't leave us any notes. We have boxes and boxes of archival material, um, but we have no notes about how she actually worked in the studio. Um, she, if we can take from examples that we do know, in printmaking and things like this, uh, she she kind of experimented when things were in her hands. So um, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say, unfortunately. Uh, so the majority of, of her weavings um, were made on these eight harness looms. Um, she also had a countermarch loom that she brought from Germany in 
Um, but that we believe was also originally a harness. Um, excuse me, have a sneeze. Um, Um, so, uh, as for whether or not her warps are re-threaded for the different pieces, um, I'm not sure. I, I think there are a couple of cases in which they, they may be, but the majority, uh, particularly in that gap, um, from 1954 to 58, uh, there's a possibility, but there's also a pretty good chance that she specifically planned her threading for the, the sort of largest amount of variation uh, possible. I mean, she had been weaving for a very long time um, and I think knew very well how, um, how to play within the structures of, uh, of, the, of the loom. Um, and the changing of the threading seems like it would be in a way counterintuitive to the way that she worked um, in terms of getting sort of the, the, the most out of the minimal, um, uh, not effort, but setting herself up to be able to experiment and have these different uh, permutations and, and changes to, to the material. Um, so my guess, uh, and I haven't, again, I haven't sat down beyond this point to start really diving into the specific threading of each uh, piece, um, but I imagine that, that the threading is pretty consistent per warp. Is there a record of industrial weavings that were based on Annie's hand weaving swatches? Um, there is not one place. Um, Annie designed um, industrial textiles for null fabrics. Um, and um, we also know that she was selling designs or, or trying to sell designs uh, throughout sort of, especially through the 40s and 50s. Um, she then also later worked with S Collection and Sunar to produce more casement materials, sort of more um, transparent uh, window coverings and things of this nature. Uh, but those were in fact, um, after she had stopped weaving, which was in 1968, and were based on drawings and were more graphic. Um, um, Meharam has, has produced a couple of designs based on Annie's, on a couple of her uh, textile samples. And, and then now also uh, the foundation, the Albers Foundation works with, um, with designers independently, uh, Christopher Farr, um, we've worked with uh, Suzanne Tick uh, to, to di design different textiles based on her designs. Um, Eduardo Portillo. Um, yes, uh, I do hope um, very much to um, to publish all of this <clears throat> and uh, as it develops um, to continue sharing it because I think it's really uh, fascinating and and really teaches us a lot about um, about Albers. Um, saludos. <laughs> um, Um, the, so the majority of her, there's a couple of questions that have come in uh, about dyeing, and as I mentioned, no, um, they may have been hand dyed, but not by any Albers. Uh, she would have, um, the majority of, we have one sheet that has lists, um, suppliers and framers and things like this, and they're pretty much like um, um, your sort of classic yarn shop or um, or art supply place. Um, 
I think in, in terms of uh, perhaps the, the much larger commissions, um, she absolutely is working with, with industry in a closer way. Unfortunately, she didn't keep a lot of that correspondence, so we're not sure um, who she was working with uh, for a lot of these things. Um, a really great question about how she communicated weaving knowledge to her students. Um, Albers, I think, was a really excellent teacher. Um, and per, although we don't have a lot of um, first time information about how she was on sort of a day to day uh, level, um, she wrote about teaching really eloquently. Um, she wrote about um, about how a weaving is made and how one approaches it and the way that she talks about it. So I would really recommend anybody who's interested uh, read Unweaving, um, which uh, was published in 1965. And we recently re-editioned it in 2017 uh, with Princeton um, Architectural Press. I believe that you can uh, anticipate a French translation of the book in 2021. Um, and we did work with the uh, Museo um, Guggenheim in Bilbao to do a uh, version in Spanish and Euskera, um, although I'm not quite sure how available that is anymore. Also, um, Albers's writings on design, selected writings on design is in English, is available, I think on our bookshop, um, Albers shop com for the plug. Uh, but then it's also recently been um, translated through Alias Press in Ciudad de Mexico. Um, and that's available in Spanish as well. Um, so there's a lot of really uh, great access for um, reading her words, uh, which I would really recommend. Um, also, we have a couple of lectures and things on our website. Um, where she sort of talks about her uh, experience in education um, and how she taught students. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, underway and Memo are at the Hirschhorn. Um, I think, let me just go back here. Uh, intersecting is in Bachop. It's in Bachop um, at the Joseph Albers Museum. I'll just pick maybe one or two more here. There's a lot of questions. So I apologize if we can't get to everybody. Uh, but. Um, yes, to answer a couple of questions all at once, um, Rangna has mentioned that, in fact, this has been recorded. I am very happy for it to be shared. Um, and I think that it will be on the Textile Month um, uh, YouTube page and possibly, if we can work it out, also um, at the, on the Albers Foundation website. Um, And yes, uh, here's, we'll do two more. Um, Annie Albers did weave some rugs. Uh, she wove rugs at the Bauhaus and, um, and um, as well for a, a few different people um, later on. She did design rugs more, uh, really. And so she, she worked with, um, with rug weavers to uh, realize some designs for her. Um, did Annie Albers do projects in three dimensions or more? No. Um, really, she, uh, I mean, in terms of maybe not art related things, um, she 
she did make some clothing. Uh, not sure if she ever wove the fabric for that, uh, but really she made materials for the space. She was very interested in multiple, in three dimensions because she was really interested in architecture um, and textiles relationship to architecture, which I think is a really interesting um, avenue. Um, and she wrote about it. We have um, a, a couple of writings on that on the website. Um, which I would highly recommend uh, because I think it was something that she was extremely fascinated in. And in fact, is uh, um, one of the, I think some of the only times that she spoke at Yale while they were living in Connecticut was in fact to architecture students. Um, and let's just take one more. Um, let's go down here to the bottom. Um, what is known about Annie's influence on Ruth Asawa? I think that's a great question. Um, Annie and Ruth uh, had a really affectionate relationship. Um, for a little bit of background, Ruth Asawa was a student at Black Mountain College. Um, <clears throat> she um, had taken the weaving course with Annie at Black Mountain, but she also took uh, drawing and design and um, uh, art classes with Joseph and eventually really stuck with Joseph's classes. Um, I'm not sure that um, if Annie would have considered her, her a, a perfect pupil in the weaving studio, but I know uh, from the correspondence and from the letters that we have that she definitely um, they definitely had a lot of respect for each other's work. Um, uh, Annie Albers and Ruth Asawa were in communication for pretty much all of Annie's life after um, they, after the Alberts just left the left Black Mountain. And I think that the concept of material uh, and the importance of listening to the material is probably one of the um, essential. Um, elements of both uh, Annie's weavings as well as Ruth's work, where she had to embrace the materiality of the wire and the things that she was working with, particularly for the sculptures. Um, and so uh, I think that there's a certain amount there, um, but there was, a, there was always a communication between Joseph and Annie and, and Ruth, um, yeah, which is really affectionate and, and encouraging. So, um, Sorry, I can't get to everybody, but I think that's okay for now. Um, thank you all so very much for joining us. It's been a really fun way to spend the afternoon. Thank you so much, Karis. We will thank put you. it on the YouTube channel. Perfect. So hopefully people can watch it there. Fantastic. And thank you everybody for attending and please check out our program textalmont.nyc. We have a lot of more upcoming events. Thank you. Great. Thanks.